mine is Michael Castell. I'm from the University of Warwick, uh, and this is the Social Lives of Generative Networks. Um, so uh, as we've seen from many uh, papers in this conference, uh, computer science is now a social science, uh, whether the researchers and practitioners uh, appreciate it or not. Uh, because this is a cognition and education uh, session, um, uh, I'm going to sort of focus on uh, the question of uh, that is not often asked, which is what type of learning is machine learning or, or deep learning? So there are many theories of human learning, and it's not uh, completely clear uh, exactly whether, you know, in, in what ways they correspond to those or don't correspond to those. Um, and I'm also interested in this question of what theories of society computer science will invent or reinvent. Uh, deep learning is often considered to be a scientific revolution, but I prefer to think of it kind of as a superposition of past epistemic breaks and into what I call an epistemic ensemble. So uh, deep learning uh, involves aspects of behaviorism and cognitivism and connectionism, these things that, are, that were previously kind of in opposition to each other. Um, it also includes aspects of structuralism, so the idea that uh, meaning is something that exists in a high dimensional space. Um, and it's all wrapped up with this sort of methodology of machine learning, this algorithmic modeling. Um, and this is sort of, you know, best represented by the, the convolutional uh, neural network, which learns features at various, various scales and, you know, it's making possible this new, new types of uh, dystopian surveillance state. Um, an interesting architecture in uh, deep learning is the generative adversarial network, or GAN. Um, this network is characterized by uh, having uh, not just one quote-unquote AI, but, but two. Um, there's the discriminator on the right side, which is similar to the to the uh, classifier shown in the previous slide that sort of learns from a training set of data um, how uh, to learn about uh, uh, w uh, what a digit is. And then there's a generator, which is a kind of inverted version um, that tries to produce things that are that the, that the discriminator thinks are real digits. Um, and uh, what's interesting is that these are kind of in a dia dialogue with each other. And, and in a way, it's kind of social. And you can sort of see that over time, the, the, gener the, the generator learns to produce things that are kind of plausibly uh, human-readable digits. Um, now, the socio French sociologist Pierre Bourdieu is definitely not concerned with the uh, generation of fake images, but he was definitely concerned with the uh, generation of, uh, uh, of social class and, and, and the reproduction of, of social hierarchy. Uh, and his sort of explanation for how that comes about uh, was something called the habitus, which he described as uh, systems of durable, transposable dispositions, these structured structures predisposed to function as structuring structures, which are objectively regular, or regulated and regular without in any way being the product of obedience to rules um, that are sort of collectively orchestrated without the pro being the product of an orchestrating action of a conductor. Uh, so that's kind of a mouthful, and, and sociology grad students everywhere struggle with this kind of text to try to figure out what Bourdieu is talking about. Uh, but you can look at some of the secondary literature to figure out uh, sort of uh, what he's getting at. Um, and so in, uh, in this sort of a later, later uh, paper, um, the author describes uh, Bourdieu's habitus as being composed of both a perceptual and classifying structure and a generative structure of practical action. So both of those are aspects of the habitus. Both of those have a you know, dialectical relationship with each other. And so when you read those, you should just go back and look at the GAN and think, oh, there's like, you know, discriminator, right, the perceptual and classifying structure, and there's the generator, which is the generative structure of practical action. So I, you know, I sort of went back and forth between like not really understanding, understanding Bourdieu, looking at deep learning and going back to Bourdieu and being like, oh, this makes sense now. You can kind of think of the GAN as like a crude implementation of this theory. Um, and so I, I kind of just, you know, this, this paper represents my explorations of like what that analogy can kind of do for us conceptually. Um, and so it's interesting to, to recognize that, um, you know, the, the, the early critical AI studies of like Hubert Dreyfus and Lucy Suchman and Phil Ager um, have something in common with Bourdieu and also with connectionism in that, in that they were opposed to a, a, a perspective of, um, of rule following and sort of a, this planning ideology of good old fashioned AI. Um, so, you know, Bourdieu writes about, I mean, how can, how can behavior be regulated without being the product of obedience to rules is like a motivating question for him. Um, and, uh, and David Rumelhart, as he's developing uh, sort of the, the, the multi-layer uh, neural network models for doing like uh, English past tense learning, uh, he's, you know, sort of opposed to this idea that, there, that language has rules and thought has rules. And, he, you know, he's like language is full of exceptions to the rules. You know, there must be some, something wrong with this. Um, and, and neural networks were kind of like the, the, the way out of that problem. 
Um, this continued in the early 1990s, so uh, Jeffrey Elman, who uh, developed the recurrent neural network, um, worked with uh, sort of developmental psychologists like Elizabeth Bates and others uh, in the early 1990s, um, sort of analogizing the training of a neural network to theories of like developmental psychology. Um, this is really interesting, sort of like sort of forgotten branch of, uh, of the neural network literature in the 90s. Um, one way that we can apply this to GANs is if you look at how uh, GANs are trained. So they're quite hard to train. It's very, they're very sort of finicky. Um, but one thing that you have to do is you have to keep the discriminator just a little bit ahead of the generator. So the, the discriminator can't be too smart because if it is, the, the generator will never be able to fool it. Um, and this idea of having, a, having the, the teacher be a little bit ahead of the student maps on very well to Lev Vygotsky's uh, zone of proximal development, which is the same sort of idea. You don't want a teacher to be too far ahead of the student, and you obviously don't want the teacher to be behind the student. There's like a sweet spot in between. Um, we can also look at other learning theorists like uh, Jean Piaget. Um, he writes about uh, how he thinks that uh, human knowledge is essentially active. To know is to assimilate reality into systems of transformations, and he's opposed to this idea uh, that knowledge is a passive copy of reality, um, and instead knowledge is something that's a system of transformations that becomes progressively adequate. Um, and in this animations of, of GANs, you can kind of, you know, sort of get a feel for um, how the model is sort of like, you know, constantly struggling to produce the environment of their of the training data without ever having experienced it directly. So it's not making copies of the training data; it's trying to sort of bring it into motion progressively. Um, uh, however, you know, we, we can, uh, you know, so sometimes these analogies break down, and when they break down is almost where it's most productive, right? So um, it's quite interesting that Ian Goodfellow, who developed the GAN um, in, Bourdieu's, uh, in Bourdieu, also, uh, they both use uh, metaphors from game theory kind of uh, extensively in their work. So uh, Ian Goodfellow defines the GAN as this kind of minimax equation um, where the discriminator is trying to sort of maximize the, the um, uh, the, the, the equation on the left, which is the, the number of times it, it rec successfully recognizes a digit, and it's trying to minimize the component on the right, which is how often it gets fooled by the generator. Um, at the same time, uh, Bourdieu defines the habitus as a system of dispositions, which is attuned to what's called the field, which is a space defi de defined by a game offering certain prizes or stakes. Now, you know, the difference is, you know, Ian Goodfellow is using game theory because in a way that's the only social theory that computer scientists have learned, right? Whether it's in their own classes or in <laughs> Economics 101, um, it's not necessarily the only theory of the social that's, that's possible here. Um, and, uh, and, there are many, there, and there are many papers that sort of follow on, on, on the GAN paper that try to sort of, you know, break down like wh why this doesn't quite work, right? This isn't the perfect equation because GANs are, you know, like I said, they're very, very tricky to train correctly. Um, and so, you know, for Bourdieu, you know, game theory is like, uh, it, it's, it's got a lot of assumptions in it that he thinks are very unrealistic in sort of social reality. So, you know, there's this assumption of instrumental rationality, which we can think of analogous as to this, you know, unidimensional uni loss function, um, as well as this uh, sort of assumption that, you know, all the actors um, have common knowledge of rationality and common priors. They, they know the rules of the game and all of that. Um, and so for him, uh, for, for Bourdieu, this kind of utilitarian approach is like the degree zero of sociology. It's really just a starting point. Um, and, uh, and I think that if we can draw any conclusion from this, it might be that we might consider spending less time uh, focusing on supervised learning and, and more sort of time critically approaching reinforcement learning, which is at least historically more amenable to this kind of economic ideology of like the rational actor. Uh, all right, thank you.